if the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. My guest today is historian and author, Dr. Sean McKeegan. He is currently the Francis Flournoy Professor of European History and Culture at Bard College in upstate New York. He has traveled the world researching, studying, and teaching Russian and Eastern European studies. He is the author of numerous books, including The Berlin Baghdad Express, The Russian Origins of the First World War, The Ottoman Endgame, and July 1914, Countdown to War. His most recent work is Stalin's War, a new history of World War II, and that will be our topic of discussion today. Of the book, the Eurasia Review says, a well-written book, the product of massive research involving every detail of the war, Stalin is intimately painted in all his colors. And we are very pleased to have the distinguished professor and award-winning historian with us today. Welcome, Dr. McKeegan. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Pleasure to be here. How difficult is it when you're doing research and you have to look back into old Soviet records and if you're dealing with a man like Stalin, the propaganda and the mythology to get through that to the real kernel of the truth, how difficult is that to do? Well, it's it's difficult these days and unfortunately it's becoming more and more difficult uh, to get into these kinds of materials in the Russian archives. Curiously enough, I've done a lot of work on the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, really the period of kind of Lenin's primacy. And the Russian government is not nearly as sensitive about all that and Lenin as they are about Stalin in the Second World War. It's just a very sensitive topic over there. And so one has to be very careful in how one goes about uh, proposing both the research question topic and so on. And then in some archives, like the Soviet military archives in Podolsk, it's virtually impossible now for Western researchers to get in. Again, it depends a bit on the archive, a bit on the subject. The, the archives run directly by the Russian government. The foreign ministry and the military archives are almost impossible to get into. And the diplomatic archives, you can get in if you kind of pull the right levers. But even then, they're only going to let you see what they feel like letting you see. Archives run by the Ross Archiv. It's kind of a, a subsidiary of the state, but where they're run independently, they're not nearly as strict. But that said, they're still redactions and, and limits sometimes on, on the research parameters. Dr. McKeegan, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Das Vidanya barrel-aged Russian Imperial Stout from Destel Brewing of Normal, Illinois. Like a Russian nesting doll, the secret of Das Vidanya lies locked deep within her dark, mysterious, and elaborate wooden layers. And if you find yourself in central Illinois, make your way over to Normal and try Das Vidanya. Remember, the best way to enjoy an episode is with one of our featured brews. This is also my time to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Simply hit the subscribe button on the directory or service that you use and get the newest material immediately after it is released. It's the only way to get that new material right away. And to our growing legion of listeners and supporters from thousands of cities and towns in over 80 countries, I have to say thank you. And now, I raise my Das Vidanya Russian Imperial Stout very high. And to the historic grit of the Russian people, I say cheers. Before we get into the Second World War, could you provide some background on Stalin's upbringing and his rise to power? It seems it's an incredible long shot from a kid from Georgia. 
Well, I suppose it does. On the other hand, you have this odd historical precedent. If you go all the way back to Alexander the Great, uh, essentially being from from kind of Macedon leading off the Greek armies, you have Napoleon from Corsica, Hitler famously from Austria. There is this odd, almost a kind of a, a an unexpected historical rule. It seems like where sometimes an outsider can rule perhaps more ruthlessly and cruelly. And I think clearly the Caucasian milieu from which Stalin arose, that is to say Georgia, and then also some of the big cities, places like Tiflis, places like Baku, where he cut his teeth politically. There was a little bit of a kind of a vendetta or almost gangland culture that obviously I think helped him hone his skills as a survivor, as a, as a squabbler. And then he obviously got, he got his hands dirty, so to speak, in the 1905 revolution on the, on the ground. Some of the kind of street organizing, some of it, there was a little bit of brawling, but really he was more of a kind of behind the scenes politician and organizer. He was involved allegedly, famously, no one has ever maybe proved it definitively, but it's generally believed he was involved in this great kind of a heist, an armored heist in Tiflis in 1907, which again, even though he never formally took credit, it was kind of generally thought in the movement that he was behind it. And this helped give him some bona fides with, with Lenin and the other Bolshevik leaders. And then, you know, he, he toiled and suffered away in, in Russia during the war. I mean, one thing he had, which Lenin didn't have, was actually long experience really in, in the Russian prison network in Siberia. Lenin was exiled and he did go to Siberia, but when he was there, it was kind of a, he took his mother along, took his wife, even had a servant. It was a little bit like a holiday where Stalin was sent at least eight times to Siberia during the war when Lenin was mostly in Switzerland and Trotsky was kind of cavorting around Paris and New York. Stalin was exiled into the furthest reaches of Siberia. So to some extent, he had a real on the ground credibility, I think, which, which helped him emerge from the ruthless rough and tumble of, of the Bolshevik party uh, to a position of leadership. Stalin's credited with industrializing Russia, and he's able to coalesce power really with just intense brutality during the Great Purge, considering the domestic situation in the Soviet Union in the 30s. How prepared are they actually for war? Well, that's a big question, Robin, a very difficult question, particularly if you look at how things go on the ground. Obviously, when Nazi Germany invades and things don't go well, the first half year at least, and really well into 1942, the, the usual line has been, oh, well, despite the you know, the bombast, despite all the blast furnaces and the rhetoric about the Soviet arms build up in the tanks, that the Soviets really were unprepared. I think there, there, there's a lot of nuance to the question. It, it's a hard one to answer in a kind of simple up or down sort of way, you know, which is to say that both on paper and even to some extent in reality, the achievements of the five-year plans were real. That is to say, they really did reach these astonishing metrics in terms of the raw production indices, in terms of the numbers of, of tanks and warplanes and anti-aircraft guns and ammunition, weapons, rifles. They did produce a vast amount of armaments. However, there were obviously going to be kind of problems. Uh, there, I think this is just some of it is, is endemic in a central planning system where you can set these production targets, but you can't necessarily plan for all unforeseen contingencies. So that, for example, that they have, they outnumber the Germans as much as four or five to one in tanks, supposedly in the arsenal in the tank park in 1941. They're lacking a lot of spare parts. You know, they're lacking a lot of kind of the logistics that you need in order to maintain the tanks so that operationally speaking, the real number is much lower. So on the one hand, you can credit the achievement. You say they really did at yet, obviously, great human cost. They did produce a vast amount of armament in the 12 odd years or so between the launching of the five-year plans and the beginning of the war with Nazi Germany. Uh, but as you saw already in the, the war with Finland, 1939, 1940, and then you would see again on the ground with Germany, there, there are these huge gaps. There are these huge problems that remain in logistics, obviously training. Training is another huge question. They, they may have had a vast number of warplanes, fighters, bombers, etc., but their pilots were not as well trained. The number of accidents was atrocious. I mean, the, the amount of casualties just in the accidents were, were horrendous. So you have kind of quantity, but then you also have the problem of quality. So that in the end, the achievements were real. They weren't completely phony. On the other hand, obviously, there were these huge built up problems kind of endemic to the planning system and really just the, the brutality of a Soviet system, the expendability of, of human capital. Your book describes Joseph Stalin as a man who saw war looming, and it looks like he's really operating behind the scenes to urge on a Western confrontation, if I'm accurate about that. Is he hoping for a protracted war in Western Europe, similar to World War I between these, what he would consider, capitalist nations? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, everyone to some extent is fighting some version of the last war. You can even see this with Churchill and his approach to the Soviet Union in the Second World War, where he's constantly thinking back to the first where Russia was on Britain's side, so that even when Stalin and Hitler are cooperating, he still sees Russia as the ultimate ally. In the case of, of Stalin, he's absolutely still thinking about the First World War, the aftermath, the Russian Civil War, the birth of really the Bolshevik Russia, of communist Russia, out of the First World War, the clash between the great powers, the highest stage of imperial. There's a whole kind of ideological framework in which he views this. And I think beginning around, you can even see this in the language, in the, uh, the so-called short course, this kind of Bible uh, authoritative treatment of the history of communism, which Stalin whether or not he wrote the whole thing, he certainly signed off on it in The Influence, it published in 1938. They're already talking about what they call the Second Imperialist War. So they absolutely think this is happening. It's happening already. It's happening inevitably. And the key is to kind of manipulate it in such a direction that what Stalin hopes, of course, is that Hitler and the Western powers are, are going to have this, this horrendous war of attrition. And eventually the Soviets will just kind of pick their moment of their choosing. You can see this repeatedly in the language of Lenin and Stalin. There's going to be a new war. And you know, we're going to intervene at the right moment, we're going to prepare, and we're going to be the ones to put the decisive weight in the scales. You know, it doesn't work out exactly as Stalin wants. On the other hand, with the molotov Trump Pact, he helps to kind of push Europe over the edge into war. What doesn't go his way is that, of course, the Germans just do far, far better in the first couple of years of war than anyone could have possibly expected. They, you know, they, they route Poland quickly with Stalin's help, and then, of course, they route France and low countries, they move up into Denmark and Norway, and it, and it looks like the Germans have hardly been weakened at all. But Stalin absolutely wanted, and you, you know, you could point this out from the other direction. You could say, well, Churchill all along was hoping, or the British before that Chamberlain, they were hoping that if Hitler did engage with anyone, it would be the Soviet Union. So to some extent, it's just the inverse of that, except it's also kind of tinged with this rather cynical, dialectical, materialistic view that, it, that the Soviet leaders had of, of imperialism and capitalism. They were hoping that the capitalist powers would kind of destroy each other in this war of attrition. You mentioned the fantastic success of Germany and their Western attacks. Hitler achieved many of his military objectives, probably more than even he thought possible without a protracted war. Was it actually a blessing in disguise for the Allied powers, England and France, though? Compared to the German invasion of Russia with Operation Barbarossa, the Western powers didn't have to sacrifice as many resources. There's no scorched earth, for example, in France. So did the nature of the initial German military success actually benefit the Western powers in the long run? Well, that's an interesting way of looking at it. You're right. I think to some extent, although France obviously loses virtually everything, I mean, they, although they held on to some colonies with, with Vichy, Britain with the Dunkirk evacuation, I suppose, saved some of her own resources, both human resources, obviously kind of manpower, uh, along with at least a little bit of equipment. Still, I think what, what it really kind of factors into is that on the one hand, Stalin is a little bit shocked that Hitler, of course, has succeeded so quickly. He's obviously not ready for war in 1940, that is war between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, nor is Hitler ready for that war in 1940. I honestly think there's a period in 1940 where it wasn't really clear how the war was going to, to play out. That is to say, the usual assumptions, oh, we all know Hitler was going to invade the Soviet Union. We all know the U.S. was eventually going to get into the war. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. If you look at even Roosevelt's speeches in 1940, there's still this theme of kind of, you know, there, there are certain lines we don't want Hitler to cross, but... He's promising to keep the U.S. out of the war. There are even some peace feelers between Hitler's government and, and the British in 1940. I think to some extent there's a miscalculation by both Hitler and Stalin in 1940. They negotiate. Molotov actually goes to Berlin. Perhaps the Germans didn't treat Stalin and Molotov with the respect they thought they were due by effectively kind of bullying them and saying, look, you know, you're welcome to join our tripartite pact, as they call it now. But, you know, we, we kind of, we don't want you to really make any advancements in Europe where Stalin makes these demands. He wants basically to be able to invade Bulgaria, send troops to the Straits. I think the calculations are still very fluid in 1940. I don't think Hitler really made the decision to invade until about December 1940. Now, did this leave Hitler and the Germans complacent? That's another angle, right? That the Germans maybe had thought it was so easy that they weren't expecting such resistance from the Russians. I think that definitely factors in both to the planning for the invasion the notorious lack of enough kind of winter clothing, winter equipment, lubricants that would be needed for a lot of the machinery, uh, the, the tank, the jeeps, the German version of the jeep, the, the tanks, etc. 
I think it, it obviously kind of plays out. On the other hand, I, I'm not sure anyone really expected what happened with Hitler's invasion of France of the Low Countries. I mean, we all act in retrospect, like we kind of know the script, how it's supposed to turn out. We, we have to remind ourselves at the time, no one knew how it would turn out. What did you find in your research in regards to what Stalin thought of Hitler? I'm sure he didn't trust him, but was he surprised at all by Operation Barbarossa and the invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941? Well, I think Stalin and Hitler had developed a grudging respect for one another. You can see this in the way Hitler will rage, but he'll often talk about how he respects Stalin. I think in Stalin's case, um, you know, by the end of the war, of course, he's just talking about Hitler like this brigand who everyone has to obviously do away with, get rid of. But during the period when they're cooperating, I think there is a kind of a grudging respect. It's obviously tinged with a level of fear. The German armies were obviously formidable. I think what's really curious about the way they're kind of almost dancing around one another in the months before Barbarossa is launched is that the Soviets actually allow the Germans, for example, to conduct a lot of surveillance overflights of the Soviet arms buildup on the frontier. And, you know, that's one of the big themes in my book is that the Soviets really were building up a vast amount of armaments, particularly when it comes to the, the building of the new air base, like 80 percent of the new air bases built in the first six months of 1941 are built right on the German frontier, building all these new tank parks. They're obviously not ready yet. None of this is anywhere near completion by June 1941. But I think Stalin almost hoped, I think the way he was reading this is, you know, he, he certainly thought Hitler was a gambler potentially, but he didn't think Hitler was crazy. I think the idea is that he thought by allowing the Germans to see how much equipment he was building up on the frontier, he might actually dissuade them from invading. And or he thought that all the talk of the German invasion was kind of this almost what we would call, I suppose, today disinformation. You know, he's getting lots and lots of warnings from many different sources. And so I think in his kind of almost paranoid mind, this is how he reads the Rudolf Hess affair, for example, where Hitler's alleged second in command shows up, crash lands in Scotland. Hitler, of course, disowns him as a renegade. And no one really knows for sure whether this was a real peace mission or not. From Stalin's perspective, it was. And he's kind of afraid that the Germans are going to kind of team up with, with the British and, and maybe launch this invasion. So he, he tends to view everything as kind of this imperialist or capitalist attempt to manipulate and, and disinform him. So that I think to, to a very large extent, he did not want to believe really up until the last minute that the Germans were about to invade. That said, they had excellent intelligence. I mean, they have warnings coming across the frontier. They sort of know what's happening. It's just there's this element of disbelief where Stalin keeps either thinking or hoping that it's kind of a, a giant bluff, you know, or perhaps disinformation, which is not to say it's obviously he trusted Hitler. Hitler was the only man. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's just a matter of, of him misreading Hitler, I think, uh, in spring 1941. Stalin was able to develop his power. He's pretty entrenched, going all the way back to the late 1920s. But when it goes so poorly in the summer of 1941 and the fall of 1941, is there any danger that he could fall out of favor and be replaced? Well, I think there might have been. I mean, on the one hand, you're absolutely right that his ruthless approach to governance, he had gotten rid of so many potential rivals. There probably were a few moments right after the invasion, particularly uh, there's a famous moment about a week after the invasion. There's often misdated where everyone says he kind of collapsed in a, in a panic, you know, as soon as he heard the news. No, but about a week after, after the Germans have rolled up so much of Bill Rush and they started pushing into Ukraine and they're going up along the Baltic towards St. Petersburg or Leningrad, as it was then called. There is a moment where it does seem like, you know, perhaps collapse is setting in and there are even these rumors that the, they open these back channel negotiations with the Germans. I think most of those rumors are actually apocryphal. They, they were kind of invented after the fact. I don't think there's any real substance to that. There was also the moment in October 1941 when the Germans really were in the gates of Moscow. And I think that was really the critical moment where with the Germans, you know, basically within sound where you can hear the boom of the guns at the city and where they're doing all the scorched earth defense and kind of uh, mobilizing civilians to kind of man the ramparts where they had already evacuated the government, they evacuated the foreign embassies, they evacuated most of the journalists it's right in the mid, mid-October 1941. And there was a moment when Stalin was asked, will you evacuate too? And he actually said, perhaps I will, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, depending on circumstances. And famously, he stays in the city. And I do think that was a critical moment, because had he not stayed in the city, which really was a kind of symbolic decision to rally the defense, a sign of confidence. I think there's every possibility that morale might have collapsed. And the Soviets might well have been able to fight on from, from the Urals. 
perhaps a kind of guerrilla warfare campaign. But I think the fall of Moscow would have been significant and might have actually led, if not to a collapse of Stalin's regime, but uh, to a very precarious position, I think. You know, how close he was to actually losing power, I, I wouldn't want to go too far and say, you know, he was about to lose his control of the government. But that said, I think his decision to stay in Moscow was critical. And I think after that moment, I think his rule was absolutely secure. Do you believe the analysis of the scorched earth strategy is too simplistic? It was more dynamic than that, it seems. Stalin doesn't simply order the destruction of factories and resources. He's actually attempting to dismantle the factories and reconstruct them east of the Ural Mountains. Is the scorched earth policy sometimes presented too simply? Is there something more to it? Well, no, I think you're absolutely right. The intention was to deny everything to the Germans, but ideally they, they did want to evacuate as much of the plant and equipment as they could. It's just in practice, they weren't able to obviously evacuate everything. The German invasion was so swift. And again, it was the story was a little bit mixed. I mean, in the Baltics, the Germans got there so quickly, in part just because the distances were smaller up along the Baltic front, that they actually captured a lot of the factories intact. In Belarus and Ukraine, where the distances, the terrain was just overall, I mean, it was just a much larger theater of war, it was mixed, where some factories were evacuated, some equipment was evacuated. I mean, you have to say, you may be talking about Western cities from, from the, the Russian perspective, that is to say the Russian or the Soviet narrative of the war, they claim they evacuated virtually everything. Right, it was kind right, of this, yeah. this heroic operation, and they denied everything to the enemy and recapitulated this vast industrial capacity east of Moscow and the Ural Mountains. And that's part of the whole heroic story of the Great, great Patriotic War, which obviously exaggerates not only the contribution of Soviet industry, significant as it was, I'd point out in the book how important Lend-Lease was, not just the finished equipment, but also the industrial inputs. But in addition to that, you have the fact that they really did begin evacuating Moscow in the first week or two after the invasion. I mean, with some of the critical resources, kind of like the you know, state uh, gold reserves and even Lenin's body, you know, they actually take it out of, of the tomb. You know, so they were able to evacuate some of the equipment. On the other hand, you know, there is a discussion of scorched earth as well. And they did obviously kind of set fire to a lot of factories, um, a lot of the air bases in particular. They said, just, you know, burn it all down. And, you know, to, again, with mixed success. They didn't burn enough bridges. That was another thing they failed to do. You know, the, the Germans were able to cross most of the major rivers uh, intact, again, with mobile armor. And so in that sense, it was not nearly as significant as they might have hoped. The same thing with the main rail lines, although the Germans had to adjust and expand the gauge because of the larger Soviet gauge compared to the European standard. The Germans were able to successfully re-gauge the railway and actually make it in. You know, as far as kind of Smolensk and then eventually even further in with uh, with their logistics and the railway supply. So, yeah, the scorched earth was a story of mixed success, as was the evacuation efforts. We have to be very careful about all of these things, in part because so much of it was, you know, it wasn't completely secret at the time. But it was very difficult to get information out. And the Soviets are so sensitive about all, all of these stories that are so central to kind of the modern almost myth of the war, the great patriotic war, that it's, it's very difficult to kind of disentangle fact from myth. Both Hitler and Stalin, they have, I'll say, near absolute control, but there's a real difference in how they interact or how they deal with their military commanders. Can you talk about that difference? And does that give Stalin an advantage over Hitler? Well, that, that's an interesting question because, I mean, certainly Stalin has almost, you might say, a, a more total and, and you know, ultimately ruthless control over his generals and commanders you know, who effectively can be not just cashiered, but in many cases executed for retreating, you know, despite his famous quarrels with some of his commanders. You know, Hitler was not one to actually have them executed if they either disobeyed his orders or, or retreated. And in general, Hitler's whole style of governance and command was a bit more haphazard. I mean, progressively as the war went on, he took more and more direct control over the military decision-making, the, the chain of command. But in general, he just was not nearly as hands-on as ruthless. You know, he almost allowed the kind of the churn of competition between his subordinates to to produce friction, in some cases, chaos, whereas Stalin was far more hands-on in, in controlling all of the different lines of decision-making up to the top. And maybe in the end, this was an advantage for Stalin, but I don't think it's any kind of a clear-cut advantage. Um, I think in the end, you know, the victory was largely one that had, had to do with things like kind of supply and logistics and, and war materiel and, and mobility, and particularly the Soviets just having a a vast superiority in things like motorized vehicles and tanks by 1944, 1945. I think that rather than any kind of element of Stalin's command style or the, or the structure of, of command on the Soviet side is what finally explains the victory. 
you know, that said, Hitler, I mean, he could obviously be faulted for taking too much authority into his own hands. I mean, you know, earlier on, he was far more willing to at least give his his commander some leeway. And, you know, I think in the end, he probably hurt his own cause by taking more and more direct control over the command of the Wehrmacht, uh, particularly on the Eastern Front. In regards to the Russian resistance, which is Herculean, I get the sense, though, that it isn't about the Russian Revolution or in defense of communism. It's like way, way deeper than that, a resistance that calls on centuries of Russian history. Well, I think that's right. And to his credit, Stalin did recognize this. It took him a little while, but beginning after the kind of the defense of Moscow, which commences in October and then right on into the revolution anniversary, uh, November 1941, he does begin to sound those more traditional patriotic themes in his speeches. There's a rehabilitation of the church, which had been, of course, ruthlessly persecuted in the time of Lenin. I mean, it's, it's a rather interesting aspect of this. There used to be this, um, this almost kind of theme or trope that you would often hear in the West in the Cold War years, particularly among those who were, if not apologists, but a little bit friendlier to Soviet communism. You always said, oh, you know, Stalin was kind of the, you know, he was the crazy one, the mad one, the maniacal dictator, whereas you know, there was a little bit more like a good Lenin, myth, the good Lenin, the bad Stalin. And to some extent, the Soviets had this too in the 80s with Gorbachev and perestroika. In today's Russia, it is 180 degrees reversed. Lenin has been utterly jettisoned. There's almost no one who will speak up for Lenin these days. And part of the reason is because of Lenin's emphatic war on the church. I mean, I think it's also because he was more of a destroyer who kind of tore down the czarist regime, whereas Stalin is seen as more of a builder who, again, despite all the crimes and human rights abuses, kind of built this new system. And it's also the rehabilitation of the church and the idea. And I mean, the Putin government, is, they're quite interesting about this, too, in the way that they try to commemorate the war. And part of the reason they're so sensitive about it, these days, you almost, you almost hear this version of Stalin where he kind of jettisoned atheistic communism entirely and, and became more of a Russian patriot during the war. Now, that's obviously a selective interpretation of what actually happens. Stalin was still very much a ruthless communist dictator during the war, and you can see it in his language and his decisions. That said, he was enough of a pragmatist to realize that Russians needed something else to fight for. I mean, who knows how much of it was instinctual? You know, we definitely have kind of anecdotal evidence of, of Russian soldiers just responding, obviously, to the brutal actions of the Germans, horrific atrocities and human rights abuses that are motivating them, what's happening to their homes, or in some cases, their siblings, their, their rebels. I mean, you don't necessarily even need a larger cause in that sense. It's kind of it's you know, vengeance and defending your homes. But again, to his credit, Stalin was flexible or supple enough to begin sounding those more traditional patriotic and even religious themes about resistance to the invader and going back to to kind of Russian history, the time of Napoleon or even earlier, and you're looking at some of the heroic periods of resistance to foreign invaders and enemies, Swedes and Poles, French. Again, he was enough of a pragmatist to, you know, kind of almost not necessarily to eliminate the communist message, but to kind of dilute it somewhat in the larger stream of traditional patriotism. If you look at it generally, sometimes if you ask people, they think that there was this attack on the Soviet Union by the Germans and it gets right to the gates of Moscow. And then they turn the tide. They start rolling up the Germans. But it's not that simple. They do get right to the gates of Moscow. But then Stalin orders an offensive against the advice of some of his military commanders. And it's a complete failure. How close were they at that point to losing the war? Oh, there, there were a lot of botched Soviet offensives during the war. I mean, you're talking about the ones in winter 1941-42, again, both on the Moscow front, also down in Ukraine and, and even in Crimea, even alongside the great victory of Stalingrad, this Operation March, which is kind of a catastrophic failure, an absolutely bloody debacle. There were definitely moments, I think, when the Soviets were in serious danger of not going under entirely, but of losing badly enough that it would have been extremely difficult to, to keep the war going. I mean, this, this is where the, the really difficult questions that I discuss in the book come in. I mean, how important, for example, was Lend-Lease aid even in the Battle of Moscow in, in December 1941? How important was it in the victory at, at Stalingrad and, and at least stemming the, the German advance in the North Caucasus 1942, or how important was it at Kursk seeing off Operation Citadel in 1943? I think by 1943, the Soviets weren't really in any great danger of going under. 1942, perhaps not going under. On the other hand, if you see the Germans crossing the Volga at Stalingrad, 
and cutting the Soviets off from the resources of the Caucasus, uh, particularly the oils, the manganese deposits of Georgia, I think would have been very, very difficult for the Soviets to fight on, absent just massive amounts of, of American, particularly petroleum aid shipped via, via lend lease. I think the Soviets were in very serious danger in 1941 and 1942. And to some extent, that's part of what certainly in the mind of Roosevelt and his advisors justified the lend lease aid in those years. I think by 1943, particularly after, of course, the Soviets are in no real great danger. But that is why I find it so interesting and kind of surprising that this is when the lend lease you know, ramps up even further when it was probably not so desperately needed. But I do think it absolutely played a huge role in, in shoring up the Soviet defenses in 1941 and 1942. Again, you know, being in danger, that's not to say that the entirety of the Soviet Union, what the Germans didn't have the manpower or the material to occupy the entirety of the Soviet Union, but rather it's a matter of you know, can they make it to the Volga and force the Soviets basically back into the Ural Mountains to fight this kind of a, you know, some sort of almost a, a guerrilla war against a German occupation? They, they never would have occupied all of the Soviet Union, but the Germans reaching and, and securing the Volga would have definitely been a significant moment had they made it that far. How soon is Stalin calling for a second front? I mean, he doesn't have a ton of leverage in 1942. Well, he's calling for it. And some of this is, again, to kind of play devil's advocate for Stalin, because Roosevelt himself promises it as early as May 1942, which is a little bit of potentially a misstep with, I think, somewhat serious consequences. I think Roosevelt is in this curious position in both 1942 and 1943 of feeling a little bit guilty almost that the Soviets are doing such fighting and suffering and bleeding and dying in such numbers. And the U.S. hasn't really gotten directly involved in the war against Nazi Germany yet, even after the Operation Torch landings in November 1942. Maybe after the U.S. lands in Sicily and Italy and is directly faced with the Wehrmacht in Italy, there wasn't as much of this kind of almost guilt complex. But I think Roosevelt definitely felt like he needed to somehow reassure Stalin that the U.S. was serious. Now, one might think lend lease was enough to show Stalin that the U.S. was serious about helping the Soviet Union. But I think Roosevelt, again, whether it's an inferiority complex or just this desire to reassure and to, to show that the U.S. is serious about defeating Nazi Germany, he begins you know, by making this somewhat premature pledge. So in that sense, you can't blame Stalin for kind of constantly reminding Roosevelt about this and also Churchill, who gets almost drawn in. Churchill wouldn't have wanted to promise it that soon. Churchill doesn't think they're going to be ready until maybe 1943. There's still the question, of course, of where they will land and whether or not, for example, after 1943, Italy would have counted as the second front. Obviously, in Stalin's view, it didn't. Roosevelt didn't really want to press the point. You know, you flip this around, of course, and the U.S. could have complained all along in the Pacific War about the lack of the second front. That Stalin was neutral vis-a-vis Japan and, and actually uh, arresting U.S. pilots who were crash landing on Soviet soil, right? That's, a, that's the, the inevitable counter-argument. Yeah, when I'm going through it, that's exactly what I thought. I'm like, and hey, wait a second here. The United States is almost alone in the Pacific against a very formidable foe. Well, we, we did have British help. We, we shouldn't slight the British and, and the imperial domains. But you're right. I mean, absolutely no help coming from the Soviet Union. In fact, the opposite of, of no help. The, the Soviets really not exactly collaborating with Japan, but treating U.S. pilots as prisoners of war who <laughs> happened to crash land on Soviet territory after bombing Japan. I mean, it's, a, it's astonishing to be reminded of these details. In regards to the big three allied leaders, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin, what do they think of one another? Well, it's a good question. I mean, it's been kind of endlessly dissected by diplomatic historians and particularly the, the famous big three encounters at Tehran and, and Yalta. Usually the view is that Roosevelt and Churchill were supposedly quite friendly and kind of these partners. Um, I mean, it's, it's a curious thing, this um, you know, almost the backstory of the special relationship. This is what we expect to see in the war. But of course, it's not borne out in the transcripts, particularly at Tehran where Roosevelt slights Churchill at every opportunity, sidles up to Stalin, does everything he possibly can to make Stalin happy during the conference, constantly not only kind of neglects Churchill, refuses to meet with him privately, but in fact needles him and insults him in Stalin's presence at this one famous session where he almost kind of warns him about it beforehand, but I'm going to make a big deal about insulting you in public. It's very, very strange. There's a British journalist. I don't think he would necessarily refer to himself as a historian, but he wrote an interesting book a few years ago. I'm thinking of Peter Hitchens. He wrote in this book called Phony Victory. He has a great set piece. I don't have it in my book, so I have to give him credit for this. But, you know, it's about Newfoundland and the so-called Atlantic Charter off Placentia Bay. And, and he points out that when Churchill is just about to arrive, Roosevelt is asleep and he doesn't want to be awakened. And so the U.S. basically radio ahead of the British and they tell Churchill, you know, you can't get within 
basically kind of like audible range of the ship here. You got to circle around out the Atlantic for a while because, you know, FDR needs his beauty sleep. And and this is sort of emblematic of the way the U.S. treats Britain during the war, you know, going back to the basis for destroyers deal 1940, which is this extortionate deal to give Britain 50 kind of decrepit World War One area destroyers. She pretty much mortgages her entire empire in the Western Hemisphere. And the terms of Lend-Lease, you know, Britain is paying at full interest all the way up until 2006. Whereas the Russians are kind of let off almost scot-free. I mean, there's a little bit of a settlement in in 1951, I believe, where they pay like two pennies in the dollar and all their wartime debts. It's really kind of curious. But as far as like how they viewed each other, yeah, I don't think, I think Stalin was wary of Roosevelt until he kind of got to know him. He was a little surprised that Roosevelt was so keen to kind of get into his good graces. In some ways, I think Stalin developed a warmer relationship with Harry Hopkins, who made this trip to Moscow as early as July 1941. I think by the end of the war, Stalin had probably developed a little bit of a grudging, I don't know if respect is even really the right word, but a little bit of warmth toward, towards Roosevelt. But there is this last minute kind of contretemps between the two of them that has to do with a couple of things, but mostly Stalin accuses Roosevelt of double dealing with um, with the Germans negotiating a possible surrender of German troops in Italy. And, and Stalin accuses Roosevelt really directly of kind of double dealing behind his back. And, and this is what finally gets Roosevelt's goat. But sure. Churchill and Stalin, I mean, I, I think there there was a little bit of grudging mutual respect, but there was also some real antipathy. Um, and, you know, you could really see that come out, you know, in the exchanges and the encounters. You know, Stalin really did persist in seeing Churchill as the representative of kind of that old style imperialism that, you know, he had really been fighting his whole life, um, you know, so that I think even there was grudging respect, I think, I think in the end, there was also some real antipathy. Well, if you just look at it, in that circumstance, Roosevelt and Stalin are the ones who are holding most of the cards. Yeah. I mean, whether it's at Tehran or even more dramatically at Yalta, I mean, by that point, Britain is just kind of utterly at the U.S. mercy regarding um, any real policies. uh, Churchill has to, to some extent, create his own maybe a fait accompli on the ground in Greece. Um, But aside from that, you know, Britain is in no real position to kind of exert any leverage on the post-war settlement you know, so that in the end, I mean, Churchill's kind of fighting this this lonely crusade and it's just sort of wake up the U.S. as he sees it by 1944, 1945 to the, the looming Soviet threat. I mean, he has a little bit more luck with Truman than he did with, with Roosevelt, you know, where Truman does kind of come to see things a little bit more Churchill's way by the end of the war. Stalingrad, it changes the entire momentum of the war. It's definitely one of the most important battles in contemporary history. Is it fair to say it may be one of the most important battles in the history of the world? Well, I think it's certainly up there. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm you know, quite as kind of broad and deep a military historian to, to compare it to, I don't know, going back to Salamis, for example, or Lepanto in the 16th century, or some of the great land encounters involving the Mongols. Um, it, it obviously is extremely significant in 20th century history. I would hesitate to say that Let's say had the Germans crossed the Volga successfully, they would have, quote unquote, won the war. I think that in the end, they would have been in a very strong position. Um, But I also think that the the tensions building up inside occupied Europe and, uh, you know, would Roosevelt and the United States have really stood for a kind of German dominated Europe? Obviously, Churchill would not have. Churchill would have wanted to fight on. I think it would have been a more difficult and protracted struggle. But that's it. It it clearly ensured, at the very least, that the Germans would not win the war uh, on their own terms. Um, No, I do think it was significant. And and that's why I think that when you look into the kind of the internals of story and and some of the material side that I try to look at in the book, particularly the role of of Lendley, say, logistically, um, in terms of motorized vehicles and fuel in particular, where I had this German general writes home in December 1942, saying that half, 50 percent of the of the vehicles and the armored units being sent against us are American manufactured. You know, I do think that's highly significant. You know, I think that the Germans is maybe a couple of real failures on the German side. Intelligence, diplomacy, obviously, you know, Hitler not coordinating strategy with Japan is obviously a huge mistake. And also Hitler not perceiving the material importance of Lindley said, the material importance of, of the U.S. in the war. Um, I think that was a huge oversight on the part of Hitler and his advisors. Um, but, you know, that said, yeah, I, I would definitely put Stalingrad up there. Um, you know, I do think that the, the Battle of Kursk or Citadel alongside the U.S.-British invasion of Sicily in July 1943 was also quite significant. Um, but as far as kind of the proverbial turning point of the war, I think, I think Stalingrad does deserve its fame and, and repute. I've always wondered 
why does Hitler extend resources? I mean, he's got to see the, the war coming to a close and he extends those resources at the Battle of the Bulge. There had to be some Germans who realized it's better for the Americans to take Berlin. Hitler himself must have realized a Soviet capture of Berlin would have been catastrophic, which it was for the German people. Well, it's a great question. I mean, there's it's an angle of the war I, I, I wouldn't mind exploring again someday. I mean, I've actually been receiving a lot of correspondence from some kind of military history buffs and, and people who have really looked far more closely to, let's say, the Battle of the Bulge or, or the campaigning in Western Europe than I do in this book, because obviously it's mostly about Stalin's war and it's mostly about the Eastern Front and the Pacific Theater. Um, but if you look at this decision, to some extent, you go back to the near miss with the assassination attempt at Hitler in late July. You look at some of the kind of almost the, the propaganda fireworks surrounding the release of the Morgenthau plan in September, where suddenly it looks like, oh, the U.S. might be as ruthless, if not more, than the Soviets in the way they're going to treat post-war occupied Germany, the stiffening of German resistance on the Western Front that everyone talks about from kind of September on through December 1944, culminating in the Battle of the Bulge. There's clearly some kind of a shift that happens there. I mean, you can, you can literally trace it, and I do this in the book, in looking at the Germans shifting equipment, you know, new tanks, warplanes, how much of the resources that they shift to the Western Front. And some of that goes back to D-Day, of course, that the Germans had to take the Western Front seriously, finally, and that for the first time, for example, the, you know, the total amount of German divisions on the Eastern Front drops below 50%. It will later go up above 50% in the early months of 1945. But for a while in the fall of 1945, you're right. It is almost as if Hitler's kind of, you know, lost his eyes on the ball. He's, he's forgotten that, in fact, Germany would be much better off under an American occupation. But remember, I mean, Hitler was such a kind of a, a volatile, explosive character with these violent mood swings that one gets the sense it was almost like this kind of shift towards a more almost like suicidal position. I mean, look, let's, we're all going to go down with the ship together. You know, he's, he's not thinking about right. Germany's future and hoping to secure a slightly happier future for the German people. It's more like he wants everyone to go down with him if his, if his dreams of empire are going to be destroyed. Because it is, it's obviously counterproductive from the German perspective. And, you know, frankly, I think some of this, I look into this in the book, how much of it was kind of manipulated by either Soviet agents or Soviet propaganda, where the Soviets briefly cool down on their own vengeance propaganda, even as the U.S. is talking about the Morgenthau plan and crushing and punishing Germany. There's obviously some Soviet influence that I point out, and even the formulation of certain aspects of the Morgenthau plan, not the whole thing, but like certain clauses to do with human slave labor as reparations. Yeah, but that said, some of it is also just, I think, Hitler's kind of strange, you know, emotional impulse, this kind of vengeance seeking, which, as you point out, is, is, is counterproductive from, from German interests. Absolutely. There's simply no denying that. If you take the history of the Cold War and then you go back to World War II, Eisenhower does get some criticism. He takes his foot off the gas. He definitely could have pushed further, maybe even taken Berlin, but he allows the Soviets to do it. I believe you know, the Soviets get what they want. They wanted that land. And the Americans got what they wanted, which is a less costly end to the war. I think Eisenhower doesn't get enough credit for sending more of those soldiers home, knowing the war is coming to a conclusion, even though there was this long philosophical battle that the United States had to fight with the Soviets after the war. Eisenhower and Roosevelt, I mean, obviously, they're in a very difficult position in the 1945. I mean, some of the, the fireworks and the kind of uh, debates among diplomatic and military historians about the conclusion of the war and the origins of the Cold War, if you go back to Yalta, I've always thought that by the time of Yalta, a lot of those questions were already decided. That is to say, at Tehran, November 43, December 43, there's still the possibility that, let's say, the Soviets aren't going to make it all the way to Berlin, that they're not going to roll up all of Eastern Europe, that they're not going to end up occupying all of Poland. It's, it's likely, but it's not completely determined yet. You know, these decisions regarding overlord D-Day, possible operations of the Balkans. I find those questions fascinating in part because I, th I think they still were open questions. By the time of Yalta, and then certainly we talk about Eisenhower in kind of March, April 1945, sure, Eisenhower probably could have pushed U.S. troops a little bit further had he decided to contest Berlin. Well, we know Stalin would have taken this seriously. He would have ordered Konyev and, and Zhukov to race even more furiously, even faster towards Berlin. I mean, there, you know, there are all kinds of different ways in which the Soviets themselves maybe might have accelerated their own push rather than kind of concentrating and rolling up resistance along the Balkans. Because there's no guarantee even had Eisenhower pushed forward faster that the Americans would have necessarily gone that much further than they did. 
you know, maybe the Elba River was somehow kind of geopolitically or geostrategically fated to be the, the kind of line of, of demarcation. You know, I think you're right. Eisenhower did his best to kind of maneuver between these, these difficult possible tensions. And Roosevelt obviously was hoping to avoid a kind of conflict with Stalin. He was hoping that to some extent they could neutralize or at least bring the Soviet Union into this relationship. You could flip it around, of course, and say that, look, no matter how hard the U.S. did try to appease Stalin and his concerns in 1945, we got a Cold War anyway, right? So you could say, well, look, right. maybe the U.S. should have pushed the borders a little bit further to the east, knowing that we were you know, going to have a Cold War anyway. And again, so I would not put the primary blame, certainly, on, on Eisenhower, even Roosevelt, vis-a-vis March, April 1945. I think the critical decisions were made earlier. And I think, you know, you could definitely go back to Tehran and say that you could see certain, you know, there the danger, of course, is if the U.S. does invade the Balkans, maybe Stalin cuts a deal with Hitler. I mean, like, that's the other danger there. There are no easy answers to these questions. But I do think that the decisions, particularly if you go back earlier than 1945, I think different decisions might have led to a different kind of a strategic map in the Cold War with perhaps Stalin's position being weaker than it actually was in 1945. But that said, any push for the, it would not have been easy because eventually, of course, the U.S. and the Soviet troops would have encountered one another and it would have been tense almost no matter what happened. And Eisenhower, he obviously, I mean, among other things, he was a diplomat. I mean, he had, he had some real skill kind of in negotiating between competing interests. The last question I have is about Stalin's legacy. You mentioned that the modern interpretation of Stalin is bolstered up, but we haven't even talked about all of the brutality of the peasants. 10 million people are blotted out. So what is Stalin's legacy? Is he the brilliant political leader or is he one of these just violent, evil despots? Well, I suppose the answer has to be a little of both. I mean, I, I would always come down on the side of you have to focus on on the human rights crimes and the victims, whether you're talking about what the Ukrainians call Holodomor, you're talking about Great Terror, even the victims of the industrialization drives, show trials, on into, of course, the occupation of Baltic countries, Poland, Finland during the war. Obviously, no one, no one really disputes Hitler's responsibility for, for war crimes, atrocities, and the Holocaust. I think it's hard to say Stalin is not directly responsible for all of those horrific war crimes, atrocities, human rights abuses, uh, mass deportations, cut in forest massacre, brutal invasions of Finland, a little bit less brutal invasion of Romania, a fairly brutal double invasion of, of Poland, really, both in 1939 and again in 1944-45. It, it, it it's, it's somewhat bewildering to me that uh, so many people in, in both Georgia and Russia today, not everyone, but a lot of people obviously take this pride in Stalin, this kind of achievements. On the other hand, of course, if one looks at the broader sweep of history, it's kind of strange that Alexander the Great or Napoleon are, are still revered by so many people as conquerors, despite obviously the, the butcher's bill of, of, of their invasions. In Stalin's case, not just the invasions, of course, it's also the domestic crimes. Um, but I think that's just, it's, it's some odd aspect of human nature where some people are kind of hardwired to respect strength, even if that strength kind of comes with ruthlessness. I, I do think it's somewhat discouraging that. Stalin has come to be quite so admired and revered um, in Russia today. And in Georgia, maybe it's just about kind of a little bit of ethnic pride more than it is a defense of his crimes per se. Um, but uh, it is, it's, it's a little bit discouraging on the other hand. I don't find it that hard to understand. I mean, if you look back on a, on a period in history where a country was kind of both powerful where it mattered, the Soviet Union under Stalin was obviously at the center of events and was the decisive victor, really, uh, of the Second World War. So to that extent, I suppose, I, I can see that people might have pride in, in that achievement and in, in the, the kind of the heroic defense of the Soviet Union, the conquest of Eastern Europe and, and Northern Asia. I just wish that I think more people were also tuned in to the cost, uh, the human cost of, of those achievements. Well, I want to thank you for your time. The book is incredibly comprehensive and superbly researched. It's an important part of the Second World War, an essential part, really, that is all too often neglected in American and British interpretations. And I, I can speak to my own perspective. When I read Max Hastings' Inferno, for example, even though he does a great job of covering the Eastern Front of the war, my personal bias led me to focus on the American and British efforts more intently. And I think that prejudice has really distorted the Western view of the war and the truth about the conflict. And your book, Stalin's War, goes a long way to rectifying some of that. It's really a great work. Well, thank you, Rob. And thanks so much for having me on. It was a great pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.
I would like to thank my guest once again, historian and prize-winning author, Dr. Sean McKeegan. And if you would like to get his new book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II, just click on the link in the description below. Of Stalin's War, the Christian Science Monitor says, indispensable. There are books every year that promise a new history of such a well-studied subject as World War II, but McKeegan actually delivers on that promise. Our featured brew was Desvidanya Russian Imperial Stout from Destil Brewery of Normal, Illinois. And if you liked our discussion today, please share this episode with a friend. And if you want more information on guests and books, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. The music was provided by the outstanding North Carolina band Bones Fork, and they have recently released music, so click on their link below to check it out. Finally, to the expanding list of listeners from more than 80 countries from around the globe. Whether you're from Mountain Grove, Missouri, or Meridian, Idaho, or from Panama City, Panama, or Barcelona, Spain, once again, thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way, so join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. It is my duty to place before you certain facts about the present position in Europe. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all our subjects, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from from Moscow.